this is uh, This is Joe Cole. This is Ruben Off the Cheek, and you're listening to the London, the London is Blue, Blue podcast. podcast. All right, welcome back, Chelsea fans, to a to kind of a pod special. Look, uh, we're we're in summer, as you know, no matches to cover, but tons of excitement between transfers and a recently uh, released uh, doc uh, called One Team, One Dream. And so we are very excited to be talking to Alex Sunderland about the making of this documentary series. We think it's going to be very interesting to kind of hear the behind the scenes approach as to how it's been made and, and all of the kind of. Uh, nuggets about the project. So a little bit of a different show than you're used to, Jesse. This is not, we're not talking stats. We're not talking any of that. This is going to be more of kind of a fact finding mission. Yeah, I think, you know, something that's been so great about about watching the the doc has been maybe getting a bit more of that that human side of the team and the players and that the kind of behind the scenes approach. And, and now we're going to go behind the scenes of behind the scenes. So it's a very meta podcast, really. <laughs> that's and and we are nothing, Abdullah, if not meta at all times. Of course, of course. I mean, we always play 4D chess on this on this show for, throughout the year. So I mean, it, it's just it's on, it's on brand, if I can say so myself. It's very on brand. On brand. So I, you guys don't need all the the standard um, preliminary stuff uh, for this episode. Uh, we're just going to dive right into it. And uh, Alex, how how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I've had a good day today. Very good day. Well, it's about to be even better because we're going to ask you some awesome questions about this documentary. And I think just first for for everyone who's listening, what's your role on the project and and kind of uh, responsibilities thereof? So I'm a series producer director. Uh, I've been working in telly for about 24 years, I think, something like that. And my job is when a project is first started from a development point of view and the initial conversations have happened, then I'm brought in to try and make that real and the reality of whether we can make that real. Um, And my job is to create and then to crew up and then to think how are we gonna make this? And how are we gonna make this at the times when it feels too difficult to? So, uh, which happens a lot in football. So I think, um, yeah, that's my job, to crew up, to create, and to go from the very beginning of the project to the very end and then uh, deliver it to the channel. Okay, so you know there's there's a lot in football that you can cover. Um, why this project? So every documentary I've ever worked on, or most, I've never really known much about the subject matter. So my only experience of football was I had a previous life where I was a professional dancer, and between jobs, I would work at some of the football grounds, which are the male football grounds, uh, and so my other job. Uh, within my other relationship to football was filming uh, the riots. So I filmed a lot of Category C uh, uh, matches or riots and I was often with the police. So that was my only relationship with football. And then in terms of why women's football, I'm always looking for something different that will challenge me that I need something to learn about. And I felt that now was the time, particularly for women's football and particularly with everything else regarding women and trying to find an equal footing. And I felt like the story of women's football represented and sort of mirrored women in society. That's how I felt. And so, uh, yeah, I took the job, but I wasn't looking for it at the time. I was looking to have some time off. Uh, so it was <laughs> and get married. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, I took it and I'm so glad I did. Obviously not really, you know, coming from like a a big football background, you know, looking instead for a a kind of different story to tell. What were those like initial steps like when you kind of first came onto the onto the project? I think I wanted three timelines, to be honest. And I think you have to I think it was quite good. Sorry, not being into football because you can stand back a little bit and see, try and see the bigger picture rather than being so involved in something you know so well that sometimes it's hard to to remove yourself. So the three timelines I found was uh, the timeline of the season, so following the football season from start to finish, the timeline of the trajectory of women in football and where that was going, and then I wanted to see the individual stories that sort of lay within that and sort of hung off the back of it, so the individuals that were affected so three timelines. And I didn't know at that stage which footballers would give us access. And to be frank, every documentary you can make is only as good as the access you're given. 
and and so you you come up with those three timelines and then you have to work hard to make those all work and intertwine and where does that person's story come into that bit of the timeline how does it fit within the you know women's football at this stage how does it fit within a season so um yeah it's complicated actually really complicated yeah um so kind of going off that so given you're not you know a football fan how did you kind of approach making the whole documentary you know, were you looking to do research were you looking to come at it with like a fresh pair of eyes how did you you know focus on on making this so i saw the quarterfinal of the champions league against psg at king's meadow and i had fire in my belly it was the most exciting i mean i turned up and there were riot fans there and i was like hang on a minute <laughs> this is, this <laughs> This is this is not what I was expecting, and then I heard there'd been some, you know, arrests from some of the uh, PSG fans, and I was like, "Hang on a minute!" But watching that match was so electrifying and so exciting. I guess I wanted to make something that would appeal to people like me, who perhaps didn't know that much about football, but then was walked away from that just wanting to watch more. And I guess. You can, you know, what's the point in preaching to the converted? You know, it's about getting the whole thing with women's football is that a broader audience and people actually understanding how wonderful and fantastic and exciting it is and powerful and fierce and fearless. Oh, my word. And um, I just looked at the these women on the pitch and, and was just blown away. And I guess that was my approach. I wanted to, that that feeling to be felt by others. And then on top of that... I watched Emma Hayes, I was sat across from her and I just watched her and I just thought she was the most extraordinary woman and not knowing much about her to begin with. And I didn't know, want to know much, actually. I wanted to take it very much on how I felt and wanted to remember those feelings and, and work out how I could bring that together in, in the series. Th this doc begins in the 1920 season, right? So 2019, 2020 season, um, obviously kind of pre and then into the pandemic, uh, which is, you know, uh, wild to think about a couple of years later. Um, what were your expectations going in uh, about the story and what you wanted to kind of share with the audience eventually. Did, did you, I mean, I know you mentioned those timelines before, but were there any particular narratives that you were looking to pick up? I think, like I said, you never know what's going to happen with the season. So I wanted to see, and I was very straight with them, actually. I said I wanted to see, you know, I didn't want to just see the successes. I wanted to see the failures as well. Um, because if you don't see the failures, then how can you appreciate the success? The two big things for me, and I watched a lot of sports dogs. Uh, and in fact, weirdly, my husband was working on another sports dog. And so I watched a lot. And the two things that I really wanted, not so much from a story point of view, but from an access, but would give you then insight, was I wanted dressing room access and I wanted Emma Hayes to wear a mic on the pitch. And I wanted her to wear it during training. And they were two of the biggest and hardest things to, to get. So hard. And there's a massive trust involved in that, huge trust. But those were the two things that I wanted to have for this to make it stand alone and feel different. Because I thought from that, and particularly from the training on the pitch, uh, sorry, yeah, at the training ground, we would then get the insight to what was going on with the players and what they were talking about. And then we would subtly film with those players or we would be filming with them anyway but we would have a bit of intel without making a big deal of it so that then we could follow up with those those particular players and hopefully then start to film their progress or or not and therefore start to develop their storylines but again that very much de uh, depended on who would give us the access um and the players naturally were reticent at you know wary of the media and, and i remember my first day stood there and standing up in front of, oh my word, all the team and all the staff, all the coaching staff. And I and I just said, look, I'm not of a football background. I said, but I do understand what it is to be having been a professional dancer and earned pittance. I said, I do know what it feels like to be in a job 
way which you're passionate about, but it's not necessarily reflected in your pay. So you, for them, I say they play for the passion, not for the cash. And I said, and I understand what it means to put everything into a career and for it to go all of a sudden through injury. And then you have nothing to fall back on that I can relate to. And so I said, so by being able to have those moments of access in the dressing room and then access and understanding of what the coaching staff were talking about, then maybe we get a better insight rather than it being just another football doc where, and I don't mean that, I don't mean that unkindly. I just mean as in they're on the pitch, then it's about transfer season, then it's about, you know, training and injuries. I wanted to make it feel broader than that. And I wanted it to be more interesting, actually. Is that fair to say? I just wanted another layer, actually. <laughs> How dare you try and be interesting? Oh, no. Um, yeah, it does make sense. I mean, like, thinking back to a pre-pandemic state, to I mean, how, how did that that initial filming bit then, you know, like, go off the rails when the pandemic hit? I'm, I'm more curious about that from an execution standpoint, because yeah. to me, that had to just be the wildest you know, you think back to that moment as a as a human being, you're like, that's when my life changed, you know, for a period of now three years. I was stood in Cobham training ground waiting for my team to turn up, uh, which I'd like to say is a 95% female team, actually. And I remember calling them individually and saying, don't come in. And I was stood uh, just outside the women's building thinking, oh, my word. Um, and I don't know how much I reveal. We'd, we'd got to a certain part in the season. So it was um, just around the time of the Continental Cup. And yeah, it was, it, uh, it was devastating because everything had to stop. We still had access, but we didn't have direct access to those players because we couldn't see them physically. Um, so then we had to work out a way in which to still continue to cover the stories, but we didn't know if it was ever going to get finished if that makes sense because what's the ending it was you know everything they won in the end was by zoom calls you know everything you know the, the wsl you know well, hey on a zoom i mean they lost that chance to celebrate and we lost that chance to acknowledge and, and cover it and celebrate too so how did we cover it we just kept shooting and we just kept shooting all of the zoom calls the staff they let us in on all the player staff meetings um chelsea would let me know beforehand we'd set it up we'd all individually work out how we were going to shoot which bit of a zoom call but no one wants to if they're in the middle of a pandemic the last thing you want to see is other people in a pandemic, if you see what I mean. You don't want to, you're all on Zooms all day. You don't want to be watching watching something on Zooms because it's just, you know. So I think we just had to just keep, just keep in touch with them, keep, keep them on to go and then work out how we were going to do it. But yeah, at, at the time it was, we were two months off. It was March and, and the season was going to finish in May and it was so close. And I'd been on it since the previous February. Um, and we, yeah, we were that close. So I think so. In answer to your question, we just kept going and going and going until we knew when they were going back. And then there was rigorous um, testing, obviously, for us to be allowed on there. We were only we were only allowed like we had to be masked and gloved and um, be X amount of meters from people. We had to, you know, but we adhered to all of that and just uh, stuck rigidly um, and yeah, I, I can't believe we finished it actually. To be honest, I was I was absolutely gutted. By the time I finished that job, I'd been on it 22 months. And someone said to me, a friend wow. of mine who doesn't work in television, said, oh, well, you need money, you get paid anyway. And I said, I don't, I, don't, I seriously, I don't do it for that. I've, all this is not, it's not, really not for me. This is, this is, you know, and particularly seeing all the fans throughout and how unbelievable they were with us. Unbelievable and patient and lovely and kind and decent and uh, really good at, turning up a bit before a match to give us a bit of a sound bite or us being able to kind of go, what's going on with this? So again, all those people were in my mind because I was like, you know, we we have, you know, this has got to go out and get out there. So yeah, huge, hugely gutting. And then, and now, and now with the response, you know, it, it's been brilliant. And I, and I hope people are enjoying it. 
It almost became quite mythical, didn't it? I think it is funny, like, and now seeing it, but pe- there was this whole period of time where people were like, remember when there was this film crew filming Chelsea every week and then COVID happened? It's like, do they all remember what happened to all of that? And it's quite strange, I think, for it suddenly all to be to be here. Yeah, and, it, and, and I mean, obviously I wish it had, had finished and, and gone out early. Of course I do. Um, but I'm but I'm still delighted that it's managed to go out now. Um, and I just hope, like I said, the response has been positive, but I, I, I just hope it gets to a broader audience. That's 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 my thing. I just want to it to appeal to people like me, I guess, who, you know, it's it was a it was a game changer for me. Pardon the pun, but you know. Well, we will. Uh, we're going to reach football fans with this, uh, so uh, we, we're not exactly in reaching. I think maybe people who aren't interested in football, but uh, we have a ton to talk about uh, between the making of and the the fan reaction to the doc coming up. We're going to take a quick ad break. Thanks to the sponsors for supporting the show, and we'll be right back. All right, our next partner has a product that I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because, well. It's hard to get a lot of micronutrients in, you know, we're all focused on our macros with protein, carbs, and and fat, and now we gotta add the micronutrients from fruits and vegetables. It's just hard to eat that many servings a day. So uh, I started doing it just to make my life a lot more efficient. I'm getting better gut health and a more uh, durable resistant immune system. So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of, blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery focus and aging all of the things again i do it it's easy it's fast it's quick uh throw up my shaker usually on my way home from work drink it 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 goes down quickly uh and like i said you get six servings of vegetables a day very easily uh, but hey don't listen to me athletic greens has over 7,000 5 star reviews it's recommended by professional athletes and it's trusted by leading health experts such as Tim Ferriss and Michael Gervais. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills, supplements to look out for your gut health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to say give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash London is blue. Again, that is athleticgreens.com forward slash London is blue to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Your intro to Chelsea came, I think it sounds like like a lot of other people's probably in terms of being captivated by Emma Hayes. She's so, you know, the the star in many ways of, of the team and I think she's someone who it's fair to say is quite big main character energy. I think seeing her in a documentary feels very natural in the in the way she obviously kind of handles herself. And I think she's she's a person who really when you see her it is very much like what you see is what you get. And in some ways, I think it was quite gratifying to to see that my perception of her like that was, was the case. But what was it like working with her? <laughs> she's brilliant. She's she's tough and she has to be. And she made no um, she made no bones about the fact that she really didn't want to be in it. Uh, but she was very straight talking, and I like that. And she just said, "This isn't about me. The only, the reason I'm doing this is to to have this film so people have a you know understanding of women's football and get because she's always been for the good of all women's football, not just Chelsea. I've always felt that with her. She's always championed every team, actually, even if, you know, not in the moment necessarily when she's a, a mama, but, you know, but generally, you know, if you if you listen to everything she said, it's for the good of women's football. Um, so she was very straight and she initially wouldn't be filmed and I was like, but you're such a key, you're so key. You know, we need someone that's going to link us all together. Um, I don't want, I don't want, we don't want voiceover on this, which is also really hard to make something without voiceover. And so I wanted really difficult. And everyone thinks it's a glorious idea, but it's it it is. But the reality is very challenging. And so I felt that her voice would be the perfect, um, you know, person. She'd be the perfect person to link it all together. Um, and being the manager, but she she was reticent. But she then so she um, but she was 
Look, she didn't want to wear a mic to begin with. She, um, you know, and then the mics we had, we had to, you know, we have to keep changing them at half time, which is at the most crucial moment when she's in the middle of the half time talk with her team. Uh, and we're having to change batteries, you know, in her, and her focus is all about team. Um, so, yeah, it was hard. It was hard because you wanted to mic her before she went into a meeting and she'd be like, I'm walking in now and you'd be trying to get a mic on her because otherwise what's the point in filming it if you can't hear her? So, yeah, it, extremely difficult. But at the same time, her mission was the team, always the team first. Um, and also the one thing she also said, think about it, was she also said about us being very careful because of sort of superstition and other such stuff and distraction that she never wanted the team to blame us for mistakes that they were making on the pitch or that they were doing and that they were distracted by us. So she was very protective of sort of that side, but at the same time with us, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I had to wait two hours and, you know, she'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, film me in a minute. And I'd be sat there and two hours later, she, I was still waiting. But at the same time, she was back to back in meetings. Then she had to get home to, to, to Harry. So, I mean, you know, any time I had was golden with her. But yeah, it was a, it was a constant, I based myself down in Cobham which is not usual for a series producer to base themselves on location at all. But I based myself down there because it just meant I could just iron things out as we went. Super interesting. So obviously we know Chelsea are a savvy club who presumably want to project a certain image out there for everybody to, to see. Yeah, how, how did you kind of balance working with the club, you know, with telling the story about what is going on? Yeah, it's tricky. How do we balance it? Well, we start, I, I don't know if this answers your question. We started off slow and gently and then embedded ourselves more and more. I think in terms of the bigger picture of the club, uh, so the commercial side and all of that, um, yeah, I mean, I, there were a couple of conversations where people had sort of talked about the commercial side and certain things that would be great if we could show them in, in the documentary. Um, and there were some things we could, for example, G, G is so young, she had certain sponsorship with Hyundai, so that was fine, you know, and other such stuff. But when there was other things that they were saying, well, it would be great if you could do this, um, I was quite cautious that I wanted to just clearly represent the women. And if that's something commercially that wasn't normally happening, then I wasn't going to film it, if that makes sense. Because I wanted to, I just said, I just, I'm here to film what's going on and I don't want anything to change in that. Um, I think in terms of dealing with the, the bigger side of the club, I mean, Guy Lawrence was was very good, actually, and really gracious and um, met me before I was allowed. So just rewinding, I had a job interview for this where I was asked to go into Fullwell. Um, I think my surname Sunderland might have helped because they've made Sunderland till I die. <laughs> I they found my CV. I don't know. And then, um, and then I had to go and meet Guy Lawrence at uh, Chelsea. Uh, at this very long table, I was also quite far apart, and then um, and then I had to go meet Emma Hayes, um, and then I was just really straight and just said that I just you know make documentaries in terms of filming what happens when it happens, and I you know and I can only give as as it will make as good as I'm given. So I think in terms of balancing commercial, I think it was just constant conversations, which I then tried to keep away from my producers so they could keep shooting, and then I would sort of bridge bridge that gap really. Yeah, but hard. Like I filmed in lots of, I don't know, filmed in trauma units, I filmed in, but football's a whole other, it, it's just entirely different in terms of the commercial side, in terms of all the different departments. I mean, it's, and, and the first, the opening match for Stamford Bridge, I mean, that was the first big match. We'd filmed a couple of matches at like the Friendlies. But wow, that was a whole other. So I think in terms of bridging between also, um, you know, the Ch Chelsea and, for example, Stamford Bridge, the other big thing for me was um, getting to know the groundsmen who were amazing um, and getting to know all the other sort of facility people and, and being very open and explicit about what I was doing and why. And all of them were really on board. All of them were actually, yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, those kind of people are part of the narrative. You've got all the players as well. Like a football team is full of personalities, right? And you've kind of touched on the, the stories that got told 
had a lot to do with access and, and who wanted to tell them as, as well. But but how do you how do you decide like who you want to kind of try and get their story? How how do you gain their trust as well to, to be like, you know, because some of the stuff that the players are talking about felt very, very, you know, personal. And I think, you know, like Jess Carter in particular was a player who her kind of story and what she was talking about filled in a lot of blanks maybe around some of her performances and her time at the club, but also must have been quite a lot for her to kind of be willing to, to talk about. I think all of my team had not come from football backgrounds. So we'd all filmed on really sensitive documentaries. And I think without trust, you cannot expect people to open up to you on camera. And I think if you're not open about yourself and who you are, then how do you expect someone else to? That's my background. And that's what, and I feel very much that that's how the team were as well. Um, it was gently, I mean, we literally put out, I had in the, it looked like um, memento. <laughs> we, we had this water cabin in the car park and there were certain doors I had to keep shut because my room or the room that we had meetings in always had to be kept shut because I had to have, because there were so many players and we had to kind of go, what's happening there? What about their storyline with this? What's going on? So we had it all written down. So if anyone came near our porter cabin, there were certain doors we just shut. Not because we were trying to hide anything, but we just didn't want them to feel that that was a bit weird, but that's how we work. Um, I think we, we looked at all the, all the players to begin with, with hope that all would give access. And then the reality is you can't shoot everyone because we, we were a small team. Um, and then we tried to look for difference in terms of so that not all their situations were the same. Otherwise, you're just telling the same story. Um, and also where they were within the team, you know, how powerful they were within the team. You know, there's also, can I say, an awful, I mean, we have filmed thousands and thousands of hours. There's also, also a lot that we film players that just haven't ended up in the cut because with every story, you need a beginning, a middle and an end. So if you start someone off and you haven't got the middle and the end, or maybe access was tricky, maybe they had an injury and we needed to be sensitive around them. And so you lose blocks of time. And that really also dictates. So if Chelsea ever sort of were understandably protective over certain players and we had to back off, then I had to kind of go, well, how can we pick up this player later and it makes sense? Or are we just going to drip feed them in? the series without really focusing, but they need to be present because they're such a big name or whatever. And how do we do that? And the other thing also was for those who weren't so keen, everyone was fine, but if people were less keen for us to really film with them, then um, we just make sure we shot with everyone. So when they're training, hopefully there's enough cutaways. We call them cutaways, you know, so we're cutting to lots of, oh, there's blah, 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 there's blah, blah, blah. So it didn't, it would have been very easy to have just focused on four players and not actually got shots of any of the others. Um, but yeah, it came, it came down to who would give us and who and who wouldn't so much because they had other stuff going on or, I mean, the Lionesses, for example, was, you know, anyone international was not just juggling, you know, uh, the season, then they're, then they're also juggling, you know, any international breaks they've got. And that also was really hard, really hard, because then you lose blocks of time. Um, but then if someone comes back with an injury or something, then you've got to try and cover that when you haven't seen it. So it becomes um, very foxing. <laughs> uh, amazing. Um, so, you know, to kind of follow on, the documentary acts as both kind of like an enjoyable insight, you know, to fans of Chelsea and women's football, but, you know, it's, it also acts as a also an introduction to people who might not have followed the game before, which obviously you mentioned. How do you then balance, you know, com, you know, against the two competing audiences and kind of making sure that you've kind of got a, a good mix of both going on when, when you're portraying, portraying it? I think you look at every match that's coming up first of all, and you look at what's happened before and who's been affected and what's happened that week. And therefore, how does this fit into their personal story? That's then going to feed into the people who are less inclined to watch it if they're not so into football, but perhaps, you know, so it brings in the human element. For me, the big thing with this that I wanted with, with this very much so is if you're going to get an understanding of these women, we needed the human element. So you, 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 you have to look at sort of the week before, the match before, what's coming up. And then in terms of feeding in, then you've got all the other, it's the wrong word to say, but sub-characters 
as it were. So the groundsmen, as they're prepping the ground, you've got, you know, the coaching staff, you've got the physios, you've got, um, you know, people who sort of handle the well-being. you've got Emma, you've got, um, so then you look at the matches and you're like, ah, let's find out from these players whose family is going to be down. And then you contact all those and then you have to split your team so that somebody's, you know, not only filming a bit of the match, but they're also going to be filming Beth England's parents, um, you know, and but also making sure that what you're asking them is either relevant to the match or relevant to her backstory, so her background. So because we never know where we're going to cut it all in, but we want to be truthful with the timelines. So, yeah, it's constantly going. Um, here's this scenario. What other people have we got around it to tell it? So also it's not always through the um, not always through the players themselves. Who's going to fill in the gaps? Journalists. So then you start. So I used to sit, I was at every home game. And so I would sit and I would look at all the journalists and I'd be like, okay, I need him. And so then I'd go and contact and I'd go and sidle up to certain people. Paul Lag and I, I sort of sidled up to because he'd always ask Emma certain questions. And then you've got other sort of um, commentators that were there that we were then like, can we? Can we link our mics up to yours so we can, and then can we put a camera on you? But then we needed to get special rigging for that. And then I was next to them. So I was like, can you frame me out, <laughs> please? Um, and so you, and, and then you'd sort of, I don't know. So you're just constantly thinking of layers. So that because you never know, and you also, sorry, with a match. So you need fan responses before in the middle if you can and after but at the same time you need to forward think that you can't just randomly turn up you've got to contact all of them and so how do you do that so then you've got to get onto Facebook initially to find you know the Chelsea supporters and then you go through that route and then you've got so yeah and they were like I said very gracious brilliant or we're, we're going to be on this coach going up to this match you know so yeah multi-layered all the time so quite exhausting trying to think of all the different layers because also you don't you don't know if, if the story is actually from a particular match not going to become about the match it could become about I don't know a fan's van breaking down I, I don't know so you're having to cover everything at the time so yeah. uh, you guys obviously shot a lot of stuff that did not make the final um final product right the final documentary is there something that was left on the cutting room floor um, and, and kind of the making of the series that you're like, God, if I had one more episode, I would have fit all this stuff in something that, that just didn't quite make it that you loved. Oh, that's hard. We, we filmed the, um, in their friendlies, we filmed in Israel. Uh, oh, and cool. Okay. So we filmed them and there's a lot of charity work that's being done with Chelsea over there, which is amazing. And particularly for, um, you know, young young people over there, which is amazing. Um, and that would have been really good to include, but it was, there was so much, it, 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 it's, it's really hard when you come to cut because we knew we were going to have to come off the back of the, um, of, of that uh, semi-final we're at the, in the Champions League. We knew that that was going to have to happen because it was so powerful. And so that really dictates then what happened then and therefore which friendlies we used, which was the ones in France. But yeah, so that that would have been good. We shot for about four days there. That was crazy. We turned up at sort of five in the morning in Israel, and then it was it was constant. It was constant. Um, what else? I can't think. Um, but there's loads. I mean, there's loads of matches that would have been great to film uh, to have in this. Uh, there was a really amazing one in Lewis, which was amazing. Is it called the something pan? The dripping pan. Can Thank you. And and that was amazing. And they put on the most amazing spread for the girls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just really just glorious. Um, and um, so that, you know, and then I think just uh, shockingly, some of the matches where the weather was just unbelievably appalling. The <laughs> pitches were unbelievably, um, well, they were just, you, it was impossible. You know, and there was a big part of the season, but that, but then to have to tell that, you have to then open up all those sort of stories, and there just wasn't time, so we had to make sort of generalize about that. I mean, we have, we filmed like the girls going to nail salons. We filmed all sorts. You know, we we filmed quite a lot with Beth England at her house with her family. We've got some of that in in the cut. Um, 
oh my god Israel this this isn't wouldn't be shown but they made us they all had to do a talent sort of thing they all made us <laughs> <laughs> I knew, but we weren't allowed to film it. Had to, we weren't allowed to film, that was a deal. Uh, and they had to do a talent show uh, or a talent thing, and then they made us do it. What did you do as your talent? You know, I can't remember what it was. We had to sing. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was going to do some routine. It was the most humiliating thing I've ever done in my life. You're like, this isn't what I signed up for. <laughs> so, I not camera, not in front. Not in front. Not in front. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, lots of things really. I think can't, yeah, can't think of all of them. Though. Well, I mean, let's let's transition. I mean, the first couple of episodes are out, right? And and you're gonna be releasing more as we go here. But just talk about the general reaction to the first few episodes. This is obviously uh, a project that's kind of drawn uh, a, a bunch of people in, right? So how how have you felt about the reaction so far? Really delighted. Uh, there was a really great article in the Telegraph about it. I'm not a Telegraph reader, but it was great article in there there's a great article in uh, Forbes which is brilliant um everything so far that I've heard has been hugely positive BBC London Radio uh um interviewed me last week I said please don't ask me too much about football uh, live <laughs> um but no it was um it's been amazing actually hugely positive and I feel like people have really got a much better insights into the into the game or as you were saying Jesse just what you thought of Emma Hayes is what she is you know in terms of um you know her character or how she comes across and that delights me because I just think you know great um but yeah hugely positive it's been amazing we made six episodes there were supposed to be eight but due to the pandemic we couldn't make eight which was a real shame, but I don't think I don't think it's quantity, it's quality, and I think all the episodes are all packed with quite a lot. Um, and and access wise, I, I feel like we we've yeah, I feel like we we managed to film certain meetings that just I don't know feel very privileged really. But yeah, we've been I think the response has been fantastic. Has it been? Strange seeing something that was filmed so long ago and, and, and the reaction to that, because I fa certainly found it quite weird to be, you know, watching quite a lot of in-depth stuff on players who left the club quite quite a while ago now. You know, like when you're looking at like Rami talking about how she's annoyed she doesn't get game time, Deanna Cooper like desperately kind of trying to get into this team. And, and these are the players who, you know, honestly, like if you told me Deanna Cooper was at Chelsea for that season, I'd like I would not like I would have not have listed her at all in because of how how much stuff has moved on. I know it's changed hugely, hasn't it? Um, at the time we were filming, um, I think the professionalism was really coming in. So you had Bart Kohlberg, who's now not there, but he was there and he 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 uh, sort of ran that uh, coaching staff in in a very. Um, powerful way and I think that um then seeing all of the you know Peniel Harder was coming in just as we were leaving Sam Kerr I filmed her at the airport and she arrived and she was obviously sort of maybe I shouldn't have said that either because she's not in this yet <laughs> <laughs> sorry so long ago I can't remember it either and that sounds awful but I finished in 2020 so I'm on another documentary now so it feels so long ago um so yes um I think in regards to yeah, I mean, the change, the change was happening as we were there. The change was happening. You could see uh, Emma and Paul Green really searching out players and um, you know, constant, he's extraordinary, uh, constantly in contact uh, with other agents and other clubs. Um, and just seeing them now, if I think about the FA Cup final recently between Man City, where, you know, which was an amazing, amazing match. Um, just seeing the players on the pitch, and I'm like, who's that? Hang on a minute. You know, there's a load, load that sort of were coming in as I was as I was finishing. Neil Charles was just, I think she'd just come in just as we were leaving. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was it, it's it does feel really different. And Rami was really interesting because so out of all the interviews, I got hers in the earliest because I just I don't know why, and we hadn't filmed, there were bits and there were rumblings. But I just thought, oh, there's a transfer season in December and there's a transfer or whenever it's December, January. And I was like, and there's a, 
I need to get a master interviewing because I think she's going to go. I, I was just like, oh, God. And then she, then you have to subtly kind of go, uh, just thinking about starting some interviews early. <laughs> can't really say why, but I've just, and it wasn't anything that anyone told me. That was just, I know, you just start to get a sense. sense. And she, was, she wasn't she was happy uh, either. Um, so I thought either she's going to go or something's going to happen. So, yeah, I kind of, you're having to sort of constantly kind of, but yeah, the, the, the team's changed extraordinarily. I love that. I feel like maybe you you have a new career as like a transfer journalist or something. This sixth sense you've got going on. <laughs> really not, really not. Yeah, it was funny as we were setting up and she's like, so am I the first? And I was like, yeah, I just thought pre-Christmas we'd get one in. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Just just getting in a uh, room on the back before she goes. Anyway, to kind of, I think I think to kind of wrap it up, um, what can we expect from the rest of the episodes that we've what we got to look forward to? Oh, um, more player access, I think. Um, a lot of highs and lows. I mean, standard. As I said to them, if I don't film the, the failures, we can't really appreciate the successes. I think even more of an understanding of Emma Hayes. Um, a, an amount of frustration, uh, moments of joy. Can I say in the middle of this something that did happen quite a lot? So radio mics are quite expensive, and particularly the ones at a long range. Emma Hayes dropped hers down the loo about three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. The very common said, oh, it's fine. And I'm thinking, oh. The length she was going to, to, to make yeah. sure you didn't get that concept. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. That's a real dog ate my homework excuse. Sorry, yeah. my mic dropped down the toilet. It's really? happened again. <laughs> oh, no. Third yeah. time this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was that was interesting. <laughs> can can I ask a fun bonus question to end? Uh, and this, I need an approximate number because there's no way to probably know this. How many times did Emma swear on camera? <laughs> Infinity and beyond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean. <laughs> And then she, it's funny, you start to, I, I came home one day and I was like, I think I've hung out with her too much there, or I think I've been filming with her too much because I was effing, and I was just like <laughs> effing this, effing that, I'm like, ooh, and, and I know when I've been filming with someone, I pick up on certain words, I start saying certain words. At the moment I'm saying ace quite a lot, so I don't know who in my team is saying that, but I pick, I pick it up. And I think, um, yeah, no, she she's very expressive. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love that. She's very expressive. Yeah, Say I'd say so. Yeah. Very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, look, obviously, Alex, it's been fantastic to get a little bit of a behind the scenes look at, at the series. Again, One Team, One Dream. If you have not checked it out, please do that. Uh, thanks for joining the show. Thank you very much. Awesome. And, you know, on behalf of the whole team here, we're going to be doing more fun summer content like this uh, as we progress through. Obviously, uh, Jesse and Abdul are going to be covering the Euros quite a bit and, and lots of fun stuff coming up. So uh, stay tuned, as always. And until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high. <laughs>